Uh, my name is Mark Parado. For you guys that are, this is your first time here, I am the lead pastor of the church. Uh, Gerald is our associate pastor. The, the hot woman you saw doing announcements earlier is my wife. A good thing I said that, right? Um, and she mentioned that we have a small gift for everybody, the men, as you go out today, the ushers are going to, and it's very small. When I say it's a small gift, I mean like you're thinking, okay, maybe it's, you know, something decent. It's small. So I'm telling you now, don't be disappointed. You go, God, this is all they gave us for Father's Day. It's small. But anyway, we just wanted to do something because a lot of times, and here, here's the thing, I typically don't do um, what, what is expected on a particular Sunday. Uh, like on Mother's Day, I, I don't typically do a Mother's Day message. Even on Christmas, I don't typically do a Christmas message. And I know some of you don't like that because you're like, hey, I come on Christmas, I want a Christmas message. I want an Easter message. I want a Mother's Day message. That's why I'm here. I, I think there's still too much rebel in me, Bobby. I don't know what it is, but I think there's too much rebel in me. And I don't, I, when somebody says I have to do something, it's kind of like, really? Well, I'm going to do the complete opposite. There's just still too much rebel in me. But honestly, I really felt like I needed to speak to men today. And typically, when and I've been in church a long time, and, and you go and you hear, um, yep, God is good. Oh, okay, I understand now. Brian's pointing up. I'm like, yep, God is good. He is good, isn't he? But typically, when you get a Father's Day message for men, we walk out feeling one of two ways. We feel like we're the lowest human beings on the, fa on the face of the earth, Right? Because the pastor has made us feel like we can't live up. We, you know, we need to honor our wives and our children and do all this stuff. And we just can't measure up. We're, we're not going to make it. And we just walk out feeling like dogs. Or we walk out going, okay, you kids and wife, y'all heard that, right? I'm it. And you got to take care of me. Not just today, but for the rest of your life and do whatever I say. And I'm a... I'm like just below God, and you're, you know, you're way down here. It's like there's one extreme or the other, you know? And we walk out feeling either really low or like really arrogant. And I don't want us to feel either one of those things today. I just want us to look at the truth. And I want to honor men today, and I want to help ladies as well. This, so today's message is man church. How many of you guys like that? I love that, man church. This makes me want to go, yeah, man church. You know, it's like, it reminds me of uh, home improvement, you know, uh, just being a man. But women like it too. And I'm going to prove that to you biblically because I just think men, I want to talk to you guys first. I'm going to talk to the ladies for, too. So ladies, you can just kind of, you can tune out if you want. I don't, I don't really think you will, but I'm going to talk to the men for a minute. And when I say men, I mean if you're a male, okay, just to clarify that. We're not talking bathrooms or anything. If you're a male of any age sitting in this room or watching online, I want you to listen to this. I think our churches have failed you. I really do. I think this church has failed you. I, I think all churches have failed men for many years because we have tried as churches to turn men into women. Now listen to me a minute. I think we have just tried to make men into really nice guys. And I think that's okay. It's all right to be a nice guy. I'm not saying be a mean guy, be a you know, hateful, you know, bad guy. But I think we've tried too long to turn men into something they weren't designed to be. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. See, God created man in the wilderness. Before there was a Garden of Eden, or before we knew of the Garden of Eden, before woman was created, and if you read the Scripture, and I encourage you to read it for yourself, go back to Genesis and read the, the creation story. That man was created, and then God created woman in the lush, garden of eden this nice soft beautiful place you know with all the everything they needed in this comfortable place that's where god created the woman but god created man in the wilderness for a reason and he created us in his image it's time for us as men to be men to be real men 
And, and I, I share similar stories with Gerald. I didn't, my father died when I was four. My mother never remarried. I never really had a father figure, but I did have men that God placed in my life at times to influence me. Coaches, you know, for sports. I played a lot of sports and, and coaches and even neighbors, you know, uh, and people that, family members that took an interest in me and helped me, you know, to be a man. Because, I, you know, my mother was not, she was not the typical woman either. She, you know, she would fight with the best of them, you know, and she could whip your butt harder than any man. I'm just telling you, if a man could whip you harder than my mom and dad, I, didn't, well, I don't want that whipping. She would whip us with a leather strap. I don't mean a belt, I mean a strap. You guys know what I'm talking about, a strap? It's like, Hunter, you probably know what I'm talking about, a weightlifting belt, really thick leather belt. It was like that, man. And I mean, it was thick and long, and she would fold that thing over. Oh, boy, it gives me chills thinking about it. That's just, and I'm telling you, she wasn't, she wasn't ashamed to, to tell us to be real men and to grow up, you know? But we were created in the wilderness. To be men. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Men need three main things. They need purpose, meaning, and significance. Purpose, meaning, and significance. I see the world and even the church at times would try to tell us that we need other things. We need to be nice. You know, we need... We need to be quiet and submissive. And, and there's some places where that's true, you know. Wisdom would tell us when to be quiet, when to be submissive, when to listen instead of talk. But men need purpose. See, God created us in His image. God wasn't just randomly creating things going, I think I'll create some men and some women and they can just do whatever they want to do. No, He gave men a purpose. He gave them a job. He said, I want you to have dominion over everything. You're in charge. You're in charge of everything. I'm going to let you name everything. You're in charge of it. And, and you take charge over everything. Every animal, every plant, everything. You're in charge. And then we need meaning. We need to have meaning in, in our lives. And we know this. Kind of in, in, inside, intrinsically, we know that, that we're created for something more than what we see. Right? Don't you just sometimes feel, especially men, don't you just kind of sometimes feel like there's got to be more? You know, there's got to be more to my life than just going to work and coming home and cutting grass and, you know, doing all the things that I do. There's got to be more to this. And there is. And it's found in who we are and who our Creator created us to be. And then we need to have significance. This is kind of what Gerald was sharing about these men that influenced him in his life. We want to know, all men want to know that somewhere down the line we're creating a legacy. You know, that there's going to be something that outlives us. There's going to be a family or there's going to be, a maybe, maybe, maybe for you it's a business. You've, you've started a business and you, you're, you, you want your children to inherit this business and grow it and, and hope that someday that when, you, when you're, you're not here anymore, people will remember you because of that. Whatever it may be, I, I hope that my significance is in God. And that when people look back at me and my family looks back at me and my sons remember me, they'll remember that I wasn't a, a passive, squirrely little man, but I was a, a man of God that loved God. And it was obvious that I loved God more than anything, but that I was willing to take care of my family and that they can remember that and learn from it and, and be influenced by it. We need significance. And often as men, we want to be famous or we want to be rich or we want to be powerful or we want to have influence. But I want to challenge you to be significant today. I want to give you some quotes, last words from, from some uh, famous men. Uh, first one is from Aldous Huxley, who is a humanist, uh, an atheist, author of The Brave New World. So he said, it is a bit embarrassing to have been concerned with the human problem all one's life and find at the end that one has no more to offer, that should be offer, by way of advice than try to be a little kinder. William McKinley was assassinated in Buffalo, and at his deathbed, his wife pleaded, I want to go too, I want to go too. And he replied, we are all going. Life is temporary, folks. Seneca the Younger, who was a Roman philosopher in the first century, said, all my life I have been seeking to climb out of the pit of my besetting sins, and I cannot do it, and I never will unless a hand is let down to draw me up. Here's a man that at first didn't believe in God, but 
realized that there was no way he was going to get out of this life on his own. Um, W.C. Fields, who was an agnostic, uh, was discovered reading a Bible on his deathbed. I'm looking for a loophole, he explained. I can see that, can't you? If you know who W.C. Fields is, if you're uh, pretty young, you probably don't know who that is. But the, the point is, we're all going to come to the same place in life. All of us, men, women, children, all of us. We're all going to come to the same place. And that place is death. And so you can prepare now and start thinking, okay, what do I do now so that when at the end of my life I can look back and go that I fulfilled my purpose. My life had meaning and it was significant. It wasn't just wasting my time. And, and I don't want you to have regrets. I don't want you to look back on your life. And, and I'm, I'm going to turn 54 years old next month. And I look back at my life at 54 years old and I go, man, I wasted so much of my life. So much. And I don't want you to do that. For you guys that are older than me. I mean, even you guys that are younger than me. You know, you're in your, your 20s or 30s. You're already thinking about that. You know, some of you could, you, maybe you're in your 20s and you could look back and go, I wasted my teen years, you know. Serving and doing stuff that meant nothing. Had no significance or influence on anybody. Right? Am I alone here or is it just me? I, maybe it's just me. But I spent over half of my life living away from God and just working, you know, trying to be a, a good father, trying to be a good husband, trying to make a living, you know, and doing things that made me happy and, and hopefully provided for my family, but it didn't have a lasting meaning to my life. And I don't want you to have regrets. I don't want to have regrets, you know. I don't want to have regrets, and I don't want you to have regrets. Napoleon said, I die before my time. And my body shall be given back to the earth and devoured by worms. What an abysmal gulf between my deep miseries and the eternal kingdom of Christ. I marvel that whereas the ambitious dreams of myself and of Alexander and of Caesar should have vanished into thin air, a Judean peasant, Jesus, should be able to stretch his hands across the centuries and control the destinies of men and nations. Napoleon said that. He hears a man who had, like many men, Dreams of conquering the world, right? You look at them. Hitler, I mean, across the history of our world, our, our, the world, not just our nation, but of, certainly across our nation too. You look at people that have, you know, drunk with power, want to control everything. I'm just going to tell you something. Men, for us, and ladies, sometimes this may be, may be more for some of you, but certainly for us men. The control that we so desperately desire is an illusion, let me say that again. The control that we desire is an illusion. We have no control. We think we do. We have some limited control that God allows us to have, but typically we have no control. Not a one of us knows if we're going to make it through this day. Uh, Brian and Heather Schmidt are out of town now. They were supposed to be here, and Heather's aunt passed away. They didn't expect it to happen. It suddenly happened this past week. There's not a one of us that knows when we're going to leave this earth. Not one of us. Some of you might say, well, I'm a little closer. You know, I'm getting on up there, so I know my time's limited. You know what? Your time may not be as limited as the youngest person in here. You don't know that. And so we need to live a life that has meaning and significance and know that there's more to this life than what we see. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Listen, if, you, if you're a real man, I want to talk about real men. If you're a real man, you serve. Boy, it got quiet. That's like crickets. It's... You serve. You serve God. You serve your creator. You serve your family. You serve at work like Gerald talked about. I think that's a great, great thing that his father taught, that when you're working for somebody, you work for them with all that you have. You do the best job you can do. You can hate the job. You can hate them. You can be underpaid, overworked, mistreated. I understand all that. I've been there too. But you do the best job that you can do. You do all that you can do. You don't have to necessarily do more in that context if we just want to talk about that for a minute. But you do what you, what's expected of you. And pray for a new job. Pray for a better job. You know, better paying job. More freedom. God will provide. You'll be surprised what God will provide for you if you'll do what you're supposed to do. And you just honor 
That's what Paul talked about when he talked about slaves and, and bond servants in the days. He was talking even to us today. We don't understand that context. But even as those that work for a person, you work as into the Lord. Work like you're working for Jesus. How would you work for Jesus? You do it with all your heart. But you're not wasting your life if you're serving God. Men, serve God. Serve your creator and serve him with all that you have. And your life is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 says, He must manage his household. This is talking about leaders, men. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. There's probably not a man in here that would say, Yes, my children are submissive. My children have always been submissive to me. They always do exactly what I say. They've never talked back to me. They always clean their room perfectly when I ask them to clean their room. They don't shove everything under the bed, right? Any man like that in here? I want to meet you and I need some lessons. If there's any of you in here, my kids, I, I haven't been able, and my kids are grown now, submissive. I mean, they did what I wanted them to do because, you know, they were scared of me for a long time, honestly. I'm just being honest. I wasn't a good guy. I wasn't a good dad. And they would do what I told them to do because they were afraid of me. I don't, I regret that so bad. Honestly, if I could go back and change anything. I mean, I was a good dad, you know. I, I provided for them. I did stuff with them, fun things with them, and, and things like that, played sports and all that kind of taught them some stuff. But man, if I could do anything, I would go back and chill my attitude. You know, I wouldn't be so hard on them. I certainly wouldn't yell at them or threaten them or throw stuff. I would not model some of the things I modeled. But our job as men is to take responsibility for our homes. It really is. We need to be real men and realize that we have a responsibility to manage our home. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. As fathers, as husbands, as men, single men. I really, really want to talk to you guys that are single, young guys and anybody that's not married. Here's the answer to the life that you want to have. You get in God's Word. I don't mean just on Sunday morning when you hear me or Gerald or Donna read something. Or Wednesday night when, you know, the teens and Rebecca and Steve and the teachers upstairs are teaching your kids. I'm telling you, you need this. You need, this is your instruction book for life. My son, my oldest son, not long ago, sent me a picture of a grill he had bought. They just recently moved into a house, and he sent me a picture of a grill. Just men, right? Men send pictures of grills, ladies, if in case you're wondering. We don't send pictures of gardens and flowers. We send pictures of the grill that we bought and put together. And so my son, not, telling, not texting his mom, texts me the picture of the grill he bought. No, no words, just the grill. I don't need words. I don't need words. I saw the picture. That's all I needed. So I know. Awesome. I love it. He says, yeah, it's gas and charcoal. Cool. How long did it take you to put it together? I started at 8 o'clock this morning, and it was 1 o'clock when he texted me the picture. But he read the directions. I was so proud. I mean, a tear, honestly, came out of my eyes. My son actually read the directions on putting something together. I was so proud. It was a highlight of my, my week. This is your instruction book. These are your directions. And you can't violate the directions or the manual and expect things to go the way they're supposed to. You don't buy a car and look at the owner's manual and just say, Pfft. They want me to change the oil every 3,000 miles, every 5,000 miles. They're just in cahoots with the oil companies. I know how they are. I'm going I'm to get 20,000 miles out of it. And I'll show them. What do you think is going to happen? You know what's going to happen. Your car is going to break down. They give you that instruction because they know what's best for the car. And God knows what's best for you. God knows what's going to make your life run the best today and in eternity. This is not just about eternity. This is about today. This is about your life now. And this is the instruction book. This is your owner's manual. 
And how can you know how to run your life and how God wants you to run your life for the best, for you, for your family, your, grand, your kids, your grandkids, for your job, for everything, unless you're reading the manual, the instruction book. You've got to have it. And the scripture says that all of it is breathed by God. It's all inspired by God. If you have questions, you know, maybe you say, well, wasn't the Bible written by men and they changed it and all this? All scripture is inspired by God. God used men to put the scripture together, but it's all inspired by God. And he said, it's good for training that the man of God, which is you, may be complete and equipped for every good work. Not just teaching Sunday school. Not just preaching on Sunday. Not just witnessing in the restaurant. But for every good work. Right? For working on a car. For working on a deck. Cracking your head open. You know, pray. God help me. Things aren't going so well. I had that experience this weekend. And it was like, you know, I'm like, okay. God obviously does not want me doing this today. He wants me resting. Because everything I did, this was on Friday, seemed to blow up. It just didn't work. You know, and it was like, I didn't ask God, should I be doing this today? I didn't talk to him. I just said, I got to do it. You need the instruction book, men and ladies. God talks to us, but he expects us to act. And you look in every case of scripture, Adam walked with God, it says, and he talked with him in the cool of the day. But God told him to do things and then he left it up to him to do it. Moses, same way. God talked to Moses. Like, a, like he did a friend. You know, like he was his friend. And, but he, he told Moses to do things and he didn't hold his hand all the time. He just, and he did things in different ways. Look at the life of David, King David. I love the story of King David. And when you read the stories of David, especially when he was going to battle, obviously, I mean, God was with him, but God told David to do things different almost every battle they ever had. I don't know if ever did he send David into battle the exact same way. It was like, this time it's like march straight up. Okay, now go around the backside. Okay, go hide in the trees. And when you hear a sound, you'll know it's time to attack. You know, he gave him all kinds of different ways. But David had to be listening for God. He had to be paying attention. I love the video that we have at the beginning of church uh, with the baby. Wasn't that cool if you guys didn't see it? I told you not to be late. It was awesome. For that baby to open its eyes, you know, probably, what, 30 minutes after being born? When the father said, I love you, oh, it's just amazing. But God doesn't give us a formula. You know, we want a formula, don't we? we? We want it all laid out. Do this, do this, do this, and you'll be blessed. Do this, do this, and you'll be blessed. And your kids will be submissive and obedient and always clean their room perfectly, right? But God doesn't give us a formula. He says, I want you to trust me. When we sang that song this morning, waiting here for you. It's like, you need to trust me. You need to trust me. And God do th does things differently. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, and be strong. Act like men. Here's where I want to land this thing today. I want us men, and, and Billy and I, Billy, will you just wave your hand or stand up? Billy Eccles is the leader of our men's ministry. And Billy and I met a week or two ago and taught some about the men's ministry and some other stuff. And what we want, what we would love to see God do with our men's ministry. I want to challenge our men to be real men. Not just be nice men. And ladies, hang on for a minute. You're like, hey, I've been working 30 years to get him to be a nice guy. Don't mess it up. He can still be a loving, honoring husband and father. But I want us to be the men that God created us to be. You know? I want us to be real men. And that doesn't just mean that you work out and get big muscles. And, and you know, you... you Shoot things, you know, if you shoot things, fine. I love animals, they're delicious, right? I thought I'd get a lot of amens out of that. I love meat, right? Give me some meat, I don't care. I don't care about green vegetables, I want meat. You know, any kind of meat, it's cooked, it needs to be cooked, give it to me, I'm a man. I want us to be men, I want us to be real men. And I want us to offer as a church, a church that men can be men at. That they can come and not have to worry about, do I have to be a nice guy and watch every little thing I say or somebody's going to get offended and get their feelings hurt or whatever. And I'm not talking about using, you know, bad language. I'm just saying being real men. And I want us to have a church that provides that for men, that men can be men and just be who we're created to be. How about you? 
All right. I mean, as a man, wouldn't you love to have a church that really interests you? I just think today in our churches, so many times we, we see women that are coming to church without their husbands. Or You know, I'm going to give you a solution to that in a minute, ladies. But I want us to be a church that provides a church and an atmosphere that men can be men. Not just things to do. I'm not talking about just going on rafting trips or hunting trips or, you know, playing golf or whatever we think it makes us to be men. I'm saying, I'm not talking about doing things. Here's, here's what it is. I'm not talking about doing things. I'm talking about being. I'm talking about being men of God. Not just doing things. And I think God would have us provide a place where men can be men of God and not apologize for it. Be men. Act like men. I have a couple of pictures, I think, of Jesus. The first one is this one that I grew up with. Anybody grew up with that picture of Jesus? My grandmother had it on her wall, right? Every grandmother probably had that picture on their wall, didn't they? This was the picture of Jesus that I grew up with. The nice you know, yeah, he had a beard and long hair, which was kind of not so popular back in the 60s. And I mean, I liked it, but, you know. And if you had hair past your ears, you know, when are you getting a haircut, you know? But the nice, peaceful, you know, staring, nice Jesus. This is the nice Jesus, isn't it? But what if Jesus was more like this Jesus? Now, that's a man's Jesus right there, isn't it? I mean, seriously. Now, some of you don't like that. Some of you go, wait a minute, Mark. That seems kind of sacrilegious. I don't know. That might be a little irreverent. I'm not, I understand. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you have to agree with it. I'm, and I'm not saying that's what Jesus looked like. But, you know, Jesus was a carpenter, right? Jesus didn't sit behind a desk, right? You, you know that. He worked hard. He built furniture. He, he might have built houses. I don't know what all he did, but he, he was a man's man. He worked hard every day. He probably had some muscles. He was probably pretty strong. And we know that he was courageous. We know that he went before the religious leaders and the government leaders and stood up to them. He never backed down from them. And when, he was, when it was time for him to be crucified, he submitted to them. Not a bad picture, is it, Hunter? I mean, you know, Jesus. And in a, in a theological way, there could be some truth to this. I mean, Jesus destroyed the cross, didn't he? Not physically, but the work he did on the cross took care of every sin for every man and every woman and every child for all times. It had to take a lot of strength to do that, didn't it? Yeah. And I think Jesus was a man's man. I really do. I think he was a real man. All right, we can move on past that because that's bothering some of you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 33. I've got a few verses here I want to, I want to show to you. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is him, himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything in their husbands, to their husbands. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husbands. The very first scripture in verse 21 there says, submit to one another. So when you start talking about men, you start talking about I'm the boss, I'm, you're supposed to submit to me, you need to pay attention to that scripture. That says we submit to one another. But it does say, wives, submit to your husbands. Ask them to the Lord. In other words, you treat him like you would Jesus. Ladies, I need to talk to you for a minute. Some of you are really disrespectful to your husbands. I'm, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm not trying to make anybody mad. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Some of you are really disrespectful to your husbands and to your sons. And to your fathers. And you post stuff on Facebook that shouldn't be posted. And I don't know, maybe there's not anybody in here, but I've known people that have posted really embarrassing things about their husbands on Facebook. And, and I go, man, I know that seems like a funny story. You know, my husband did something stupid, and we do a lot of stupid stuff, so we give you a lot of stuff to work with, I get it. But don't do that. Don't do that. Cover his faults. And that doesn't mean if he's a jerk and he's, you know, wasting all your money and abusing your children. I'm not saying put up with that. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying every good man, every man is going to fail. Every man's going to fail. We're going to take a wrong turn. 
We know you have directions that will get us there better than we do, but we need to sometimes go the wrong way. And we need you to allow us to go the wrong way because we need our dignity. And this is where it all happens, right? We got a little helper in the car. Y'all ever seen the Tim Hawkins video, a little helper in the car? That's a one you ought to look at. But ladies, we need you. I want to ask you a question. When you were a young girl and you dreamed of your prince, was he a passive little man? Or was he a dashing, strong man? I doubt any of you had dreams as a little girl of marrying the prince and he was just like, okay, whatever you say, honey. No, none of you had dreams like that. If you did, I don't know what books you were reading when you were a kid. The man was always strong, loved passionately. You didn't dream about marrying a merely nice guy. Trust me, my wife did not marry me because I was just a nice guy. Matter of fact, she married me because I was a little bit bad. Just saying. So ladies, I've got some things that I want to share with you that when Donna and I do marriage coaching, these are four things that men need, okay? Men need, we need you to do this for us. This is not a want, it's not a possibility and this is now for you guys that have kids in here I'm just going to tell you you may want to cover their ears in a minute I'll just tell you that when but um, I'm just going to be real with you this morning this is what men need first is honor and respect that's number one for every man you know for your husband for your father for your sons your grandsons everyone every man you know needs honor and respect above everything else see this is how we're created in God's image God God wants our honor and our respect. He wants our praise. And, so, and as we're created in, in God's image, we need that. We don't just want it. We need it. That's why, we, that's why as, a, as a kid or when you played sports, you would knock yourself out for a coach that encouraged you, right? That's why cheerleaders are on the sideline. You know that, right? It's not because, just because they're pretty. It's because we'll do anything for somebody's cheering for us. And if you honor and respect your husband, I'm telling you, he'll do anything. It will work, I promise you. But you've got to allow us to be the way God created us to be. Okay, close the kids' ears. Number two is sex. This is a need. It's a need. And men are generally more sexual than women. You know, and at different times in their lives, I understand it. It's just the way it is. It's a need that all men have as husbands. And we're talking about in the context of marriage. We're not going outside of what Scripture here says. So if you're not married, you don't need to be doing it. You're married, you need to be doing it. Okay, close your kids' ears for sure. Single ladies or ladies that you don't, your husband won't come, not single ladies, ladies that your husbands will not come to church with you. Here's the way to get your husband to come to church. Are y'all ready? Y'all want to hear this? Some of you are like, I don't think I want to hear this. Here's how to get your husband to come to church with you. Sunday after church, you go home, and you take care of him. I mean, as soon as you get home, and he'll go, what did you hear in church this morning? And you do that for two or three weeks, he'll show up at church. He's going to say, I want to know what this church is all about. I'm just saying. Now, you don't have to take that advice. But so many times... We, we tell women, just let's don't talk about it. Let's, you know, let's just do these churchy things and whatever. I'm just saying we're created in God's image. And you have what a husband needs. And that's what he needs. Third thing is fun and friendship. See, we get married because we do fun things together. See, Don and I were friends before we, were ever, before we ever started dating. And we did fun things together. And we started dating. We did things that we both enjoyed. And, it, and sometimes when we get older, after we've been married a long time, we quit doing the things that we originally did together that we enjoy doing together. And it doesn't have to cost money. I mean, we used to go on picnics. We used to go, you know, fishing. We used to go hiking on mountains and stuff like that. And, and we just quit doing that, you know? And it, I don't know why. But that's why we got married in the first place. We need to go back to doing those things that we originally did. See, in Revelation chapter 2, God chastises the church and he says, you've forgotten your first love. And he gives them the solution. He says, go back to what you did in the beginning. 
You want to you wanna put the excitement and the passion back in your marriage? Go do things that you used to do when you were dating or when you were first married. Fishing, hunting together, you know, if couples hunt together, that's cool. Whatever it may be, go, you know, bike, biking or whatever it might be. Get a motorcycle, right, Randy? Right, Randy? Yes, okay. Help me out. But you do the things that you did to begin with. And the fourth thing is domestic support. Um, Laurel, would you come? Domestic support. And all this really means is that women know how to make a house a home. You know, we really do. That doesn't mean that when she does all the dishes or all the laundry and all the cleaning. That's not the way it should work. We think as men, we, we come home from a job and, and dinner should be on the table and the house should be clean and kids should be quiet and all that. And, and, and well, I've worked hard and I come home and this should be my reward. Listen, you just started your job when you get home. You've been at work to provide for your family, but your real job is when you get home and when you get walk in the door. See, I don't make Donna. She cooks most of the time because she's a much better cook than me. But I can cook, and I clean, and I do laundry, and I do dishes. I don't just take out the trash and say, I did my chore. I can vacuum, I can mop, I can clean bathrooms, I can do it all. And I do. I don't do all of it, but I do... I do my share, you know, and that's the way it should be. But women know how to make a house a home. You know, a woman needs to know how to let her decorate. You know, guys, don't, don't, don't do the decorate and let her do that kind of stuff. Thank God we had Eileen, you know, to do this. And Daryl helped her put it together. I get it. And Rebecca and Steve and, and the kids have been working hard. I don't know who all had their hands in that, but... No man could have come up with that, I don't think. I don't know, maybe they could. But we need you to make a house a home. I want to say something to you men, and then we're going to do something special, and we're going to get out of here. See, as men, we know how to attend church. We do. We know how to be nice. We were taught that we're not supposed to smoke or drink or cuss. But we were, for many of us, never taught how to fight in the right way. And some of you go, oh, I know how to fight. We fight really good. You need to watch the movie War Room. Because if you think yelling and screaming and, and, and arguing with each other and insulting each other is fighting well, you're not fighting well. You fight on your knees. You fight in prayer. You fight in God's Word. And you fight the right enemy. See, the one that's at home with you, that's not your enemy. Your kids are not your enemy. Your, your wife is not your enemy. Your husband's not your enemy. You know, the, your church family, we're not your enemy. But there is an enemy. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have an enemy. And Jesus didn't ignore him, and I don't like to give him a lot of credit, but we've got to focus on who the real enemy is. The enemy is the devil. He's Satan. He's the evil one. He's the tempter. Scripture calls him. He'll tempt us to give up. He'll tempt us to not worry about doing the things we ought to do and think, oh, it's just a waste. But we need to learn how to fight. John Eldridge in the book uh, Wild at Heart made this statement. I love it. It says, A man is never more a man than when he embraces an adventure beyond his control or when he walks into a battle he isn't sure of winning. See, men need adventure. And there's no greater adventure than, adventure than following Jesus Christ. See, we know, here's the thing, we know we're going to win the war. We don't know if we're going to win the battle. We may lose some battles. Some of us have lost some battles in the church, in our walk with God. We've lost some battles. But the good thing is we know we're going to win the war. And we need to stick together. We need to fight the right fight. We need to fight the fight of faith and fight for our families. I'm going to ask the men to come to the front. All men of all ages, come to the front. And we're going to close here in just a minute. All men, every age, single, married, doesn't matter. And I want you to come close. See, we don't have to worry so much. I want you to turn around and face me. We don't have to worry so much about just being nice guys and cautious and careful all the time. 
We need to be the men that God created us to be. I want you guys to pack in here. Can you guys that are kind of in the back kind of pack in? In the movie, The uh, Chronicles of Narnia, at the end of the movie, the little girl Lucy asked, um, talking about Aslan, is he safe? And I don't remember who she was talking to, but uh, who it was said, of course he's not safe, but he's good. We don't have to just be nice guys. We need to be men of God, the men of God that God created us to be. And so what I've asked this morning is for Laurel to sing. And ladies, would you stand? And we, you guys can worship. But Donna is going to pray. And ladies, if you would, would bless us by praying for us as well. We need your prayers. Ladies, we need your prayers. We do. Your husband needs your prayers. Pray for him. Your sons, they need your prayers. Your fathers, grandfathers, they need your prayers. I need your prayers, ladies, men, but ladies especially. And these men need your prayers this morning. Actually, I'm peculiar. And when God says to do something, I've learned that I just do. And he shows up. Mark doesn't know what I'm about to do. I'm going to do more than just pray. If you could only feel my heartbeat right now. There are some blessings in the Word. The Word is alive. It's very, um, it cuts right straight to your heart. And there's some scripture that has blessings with it if you obey. In Joshua 1, verse, beginning in verse 3, it says, um, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give you. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law. Your word, all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So with this blessing comes a requirement for you to know this book. To not turn from it to the left or to the right. To be strong and to be courageous. To be bold for the name of Jesus. So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to charge you. By the name of the Lord God, of most high. I charge you men to be strong and to be valiant. To be courageous. To be powerful. Yet to be merciful. To love your families. To train them and to raise them up in a godly fashion. To honor your wives. To be selfless, yet self-controlled. To be faithful, trusting God. Not turning to the left and not turning to the right, but to walk the straight and narrow. For there you will find your peace. You will find your joy. You will find your hope. You will find your strength. For he is your front guard. And his word says he will hem you in before and behind. He will mark out the path for your life. And in him, you will find all you need. So if you will accept this challenge and this charge, I ask you to say amen. amen. Women, as daughters of the Most High, I ask you to make a semicircle around these men. And I want to ask 
you to do something special. If you are able, if you are able, I ask you to go to your knees. As a sign of submission, out of obedience to the Lord, and in honoring your husbands. Let us pray. Let us praise those fathers who have striven to balance the demands of work, marriage, and children with an honest awareness of both joy and sacrifice. Let us praise those fathers who lack a good model for a father, have worked to become a good father. Let us praise those fathers who by their own account were not always there for their children, but who continue to offer those children, now grown, their love and support. Let us pray for those fathers who have been wounded by the neglect and hostility of their children. Let us praise those fathers who despite divorce have maintained, remained in their children's lives. Let us praise those fathers whose children are adopted and whose love and support has offered healing. Let us praise those fathers who as stepfathers freely chose the obligation of fatherhood and earned their stepchildren's love and respect. Let us praise those men who have no children but cherish the next generation as if they were their own. Let us praise those men who have fathered us in their role as members and guides. Let us praise those men who are about to become fathers. May they openly delight in their children. And let us praise those fathers who have died but live on in our memory and whose love continues to nurture us. Father, you are the best father. And we thank you and we praise you and we love you for who you are and for what you have done for us. We ask you, Lord, to bless these men, to help us women honor them and provide for their needs as you have shown us and given us the ability to do so. We ask God that you would change our hearts so that we can honor them and respectfully love them and cherish them like you want us to. We ask you, Lord, as your word says, that you would put the whole armor upon these men. That you would put the boots of peace upon their feet so that wherever they walk, that they are walking in peaceful love. We ask you, Lord, to put the belt of truth around their waist so that wherever they go, they are faithful and truthful and honest with integrity. We ask you, Lord, to put the breastplate of righteousness upon them so that wherever they go and whatever they do, that they choose to make the right choice. Do the righteous thing, Lord. We ask you to put the sword of the Spirit in their right hand because it is their weapon, what they can fight off the evil forces with, your word of truth. Plant it deep within their hearts and their souls, Lord, so that they won't stray from it. We ask you, Lord, to put the shield of faith in their left hand so the fiery darts of the enemy will bounce right off and will not take root. We ask you, Lord, to put the helmet of salvation upon their heads so their minds are guarded in you, Christ Jesus, that they are firmly planted in the salvation of Jesus Christ, and that is where they'll stay fixed with our eyes upon you, Lord. We thank you for these men. We ask that you would order their path, give them wisdom, discernment, loving kindness, yet with strength, with valiance, with honor. We bless you, Lord, and we bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. In your wisdom and love, you made all things. Bless these men, that they may be strengthened as Christian fathers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant that we, their sons and daughters, wives, mothers, and friends, may honor them always with a spirit of profound respect 
and an attitude of selfless love. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you one more thing before we go. I want to ask you to commit to forming a brotherhood with at least one or two of the men in here. And to help Billy, Billy would tell you, he'd say, I, I need help. Need help. We want to have a men's ministry that men that don't even think about going to church want to be a part of. You know? And it can meet somewhere else. It doesn't have to be here. But I need you to help. Need you help. Need your help on that. We would create a place that men of all different beliefs and backgrounds could come and be a part of. Know that they have a brother. That's what we need. And ladies, we need to ask you to allow this to happen. Allow the men to do it. Okay? I'm going to pray over you and then, or just pray real quick, and then uh, our ushers will be at the back and they're going to hand you a small gift for every man um, that's here today. And I want to encourage you to come back next week. We've got a lot of things coming up for our church, some great announcements, some outreaches we're going to do. And we need all of you. We need you. We need you men. And our community needs you. Let's pray and then we'll close. Father, we love you. We bless your name. You're an awesome daddy. We thank you so much for these ladies that are willing to uh, uh, lift us up and honor us, pray for us. Father, we know that you hear those prayers. And uh, so, Father, we thank you for them. And help us all. Help the ladies be the ladies that you created them to be and help us men to be the men that you created us to be. And not to apologize for being rougher or, or being who we are. We're made in your image. And give us encouragement. And teach us how we need to be the men that you've called us to be. And use us today as we lead this place, Father. We love you and we honor you on this Father's Day. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right. Love you guys. Hug somebody. Before we get out of here, we'll see you next week.